Seth Parker Woods, I'm glad we could spend some time talking about difficult grace and about your career. And before we go too far into that project, I want to ask you about something that you said in late 2021 um, that was published at University of at Buffalo, where you said, I haven't taken an easy route, but it has allowed me to tap into a wide variety of fields in areas that most people never get to because they stay siloed. And I'm wondering, is that diversity of fields you speak about crucial to how we look at music today, um, where traditional labels and definitions need to perhaps be relics of the past? I think so. I mean, I don't think there's been uh, as many artists that have truly lived or existed or created inside of a singular label. It's always been, we've always been influenced by each other. And it just so happens, how does marketing, how does consumerism, et cetera, et cetera, a and R people, how do they, how do they sell us as artists to the general public? And how does one talk about the art and the music in which we make? And it, it, I don't think it can be boiled down to just a singular label, a singular silo. Many, I think, are comfortable to live. I just play classical music. Maybe it's just easier to put it within that. Um, or I try to think of it sometimes modern classical music because we are living in the modern times, not necessarily contemporary music, but just the modern times of creating this, this, this inherited rep and also the new work that in which we're creating now as well. Um, I feel like they are possibly just relics of the past, but we, 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 as I have said before, we love to hold on and uh, revel in that which has long gone um, and sometimes not necessarily support enough of what's happening right now. Or not allow us to move forward either. Yes. Yeah. Well, Difficult Grace is certainly a project that's going to challenge us to move forward. And I and I I've listened to the album several times and I love it. I'm also a big Ted Hearn fan, so that helps okay. going into it. But I know this started as a multimedia project um, that you perform on stage, and there there have been dancers involved and projections and things like that. So, what kind of modifications did you have to make it for this to become a recording that lived and breathed just by virtue of its sound? Um, well, there because there are so many visual components to the work, um, that was the hard part. And uh, of like how for those that have the idea of for those that have never seen the live show Difficult Grace, how do I still convey that sense of vividness and adornment? Um in this in a sonic format. So in the same way when we when the world shut down in 2020 um, and we were forced to really fully go online and think about, at least for myself and many others, think about mediated versions of concert experiences and how we absorb and, and experience um, and, and live inside of work that's happening right now. Um, the same the same way I had to do that, it, it, it's all kind of came down to kind of the narrative storytelling through through production, through producing it with the amazing Elaine Martone um, and trying to um, sculpt the sounds in a way where it's still in stereo, you know, uh, but sculpt them, especially with all of the kind of the fixed media work, kind of going back to revisit them and how can they now exist in this way, trying to make them 3D still within a kind of a 2D um, experience. Like how do I create extreme depth inside of this work and allow it to feel as if it really does move. How, where does my voice sit inside of this work um, that didn't feel much like a, a traditional uh, classical cello recital where it's, there is a distance, but there's a closeness. In this way, how do I kind of put you on my shoulder <laughs> and kind of go on the ride with me? Um, and so that's what we worked really hard on is trying to kind of sculpt those worlds uh, piece by piece. And each of the composers um, that's featured on this album, their voices are so, so different. And the poets of the text in which um, I'm living inside of, that of Dudley Randall, that of Kimi Alabi, um, that of the, the journalists and writers from the Chicago Defender, 
um, that's connected to the work by Natalie Joachim, Natalie's own voice um, in Dam Wenyo, one of the other works on the album. Um, how do we reposition it and and allow it to kind of really soar and and ride many waves in different in um, in different formations? Was kind of the really the 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 trickiest part of putting it all together beyond how how I sculpted it in the live show and trying to use the live experience as a way of um, sharing it, it, sharing it similarly to how I feel it when I'm doing it live. Obviously having the liner notes also helps because, you know, it, since we don't get to see the words projected on you, which I know mm -hmm. has, I don't know how much a part of that, of your show that is, but I know it's a part of it. Mm -hmm. You know, having the ability to to see what's being said you know, certainly helps us fill in a few of the blanks as well. Yes. And then I, and for those that still love a physical object, <laughs> I know <laughs> this day and age, so many people um, gravitate directly towards digital streaming downloads. Um, so you do, I, I still love, I still love a CD or I still love an LP, the actual physical thing. Um, so for those that do buy the physical album, you get to see a lot of the visuals that of Barbara Earl Thomas of Jacob Lawrence, uh, the words and texts of Dudley Randall and Kemi Alabi, um, and the text from the Chicago Defender as well. Um, it's all very much so woven inside of the actual album and the booklet um, that comes with it. Uh, and it's quite, I mean, it, I'm very proud of it because it's a beautiful product and working with Bark Design out of Chicago, uh, we did a really great job in kind of bringing it all together and encapsulating just to kind of try to extend the visual narrative that many may be missing or um, knew of, you know. One thing you couldn't do was extend the length of a CD to, a comp to allow for all the pieces that you perform in this. So what was the editorial process for you like of figuring out which pieces were most important to include and which ones you, you could sort of make Sophie's choice and not include? Yeah, so there's just a few. Um, um, there's, there's a work that I co-created with Frida Uptan called My Heart is a River. And this work, it's both electronic and cello and heavy visual with full film um, with me uh, as kind of movement artist, dancer, narrator, um, along with the dancer Tamsin O'Garrow from London. And for me, it just felt like it would do it an injustice to only just do the music um, because we conceived of it really together, a full kind of like visual, you know, album in that way. It, it could really live on its own as this larger video format work. But I think with a work like that, it didn't make sense to try to just do the music because it's not just the music. It in some ways the music almost underscores what's actually happening um, on behind me and around me um, visually. So that is one of the ones that um, I chose not to move forward to record and that it would exist only as a live experience, which I think is kind of a, a special, like a hidden track, <laughs> I guess in a way. A uh, hidden track, but you have to come to the color live concert to see it. Um, and then um, I didn't end up, what, what is one of the, I guess the, the newest work, which is by, um, Devante Hines, also known as Blood Orange. That's the newest one that was kind of added to the show. Um, and so that one, it just wasn't quite ready for me to record it because I had only just recently premiered it. Um, by that time, I'd already gone to the studio um, to record the album. So I didn't um, include that one. That'll have to come for another release down the road. Um, so those were the two that didn't make it. Everything else that's in the show um, is included except for also the tremble because that is a piece in which I recorded on my debut album so I wasn't gonna re-record it again so th those become so the the Aftan Woods project and then the tremble with the dancer choreographer Roderick George those two very much so exist only in the in the live show that so you have to come see those there but outside of that so we have two big you know, substantial works that are now missing as part of the whole kind of sonic fabric. And so with that, I included uh, our Guru 2 by Alvin Singleton 
and then Dam Win Yo by Nacho Di Um, And Nacho is a very good friend of mine and we already had the race and Dam Win Yo was actually the very first piece of hers in which I played. And so I really wanted to find a way to um, put my own stamp on it in, in recorded format. And then the Arguru came to me, I think in 2017 and meeting and becoming very closely with Alvin, I promised that I, <laughs> that I would record this piece. And I think because of the layers of play and the layers um, of just the virtuosic writing that's in that's inside of that work, I think it fits quite nicely still with the fabric of what uh, I'm trying to kind of talk about across, you know, um, the entire show. Um, yeah, and there is a there is a version of the show, early nucleus of the show, um, that I even did in Toronto, I think a year ago, um, that included um, Dumbwayneo and the Singleton, just so I could get an idea of like. <laughs> does this work <laughs> well that's the only way to find out isn't it yes <laughs> or at least certainly the best way yes yeah yeah now you were talking about this project with the gothamist um last year and you said that difficult grace examines quote stories that the body holds and it needs to tell mm -hmm. as you prepare for the re release of this album and you have future performances of this work how has your need to tell these stories shifted and does the different ways of telling this story live performance versus recording allow for any form of catharsis or better understanding of why your body holds these stories? Well, I guess in that way, we are born as we're born and maybe questions come up along the way as we make our journeys. Um, maybe more questions need to come up that we don't necessarily ask. Um, so this is a way through these people, through their narratives, especially with like the work, uh, the race 1915 and trying to embody these real live um, lines from journalism that were coming from in the year 1915 exclusively from the Chicago Defender. Um, and a lot of them are, from when I was first reading them with Natalie, it was, it was a lot to, um, to swallow. <laughs> and, and I remember the first, like the first performance, like live performance I did of it was February 9th, 2020, just before everything shut down. And I was nervous just because, um, I guess I made it a point that, when I take on such performative works in this way, as like the acting musician artist, um, not just cellist, um, that I have to figure out what the characters are, what they're trying, what more are they trying to say beyond what's just kind of topical. Same with music, like reading between the lines, the idea. And there was, there was so much heartache, but also there is so much perseverance inside of these, but these, are it's not as if I was reading fiction these are historical lines historical documents objects in that way that are recounting times that you know things that were happening across the country in the beginning of the great migration um and of course reading Isabel Wilkerson's book it just kind of expanded so much of that for me that like I was holding a lot at the time and trying to be the best possible conduit for these people's stories, though I did not live them. Um, they are, these stories, these journeys are so deeply even connected to my family and my my grandmother, my mother's more the mother who was making the journey during the great, and, and basically just two decades after that, you from the 1915s. Um, so it, it's, it's not autobiographical, but it's kind of semi-autobiographical by lineage and connection to my grandmother in that way. So it felt so close to home to be feeling as if there was there was a deep importance for me to talk about it. At this point now, I've lived in it so much and figured out they are they are people, they are characters, but they are not directly me. So I'm fi found a space for me to be able to just deliver deliver the art, deliver the craft, deliver the narrative and not absorb so much, but still believe deeply and heavily in what it is I'm saying. So that it doesn't feel topical, but it still feels like it's arresting, but it's also very genteel at, at, at the same time. 
Um, but I would assume the process of that, it still allows for it to be personal as well. Oh, yes, uh, definitely. I don't think it's... <laughs> <laughs> I always have to like send to even every performance, even going into the studio for it, because we when I recorded that work, specifically we talked about that one. Um, I did all the cello with the electronic parts separately from all the voice. So that way I didn't have to worry about the juggling that I normally have to do in live uh, performance. I could just deliver the cello. Um, and then I could worry about just my placement for the voice and getting the right like really zeroing in and creating a, a new medi a mediated version of this work. So it allowed me to really kind of zero in on something special that I don't always get the chance to do when I'm doing it live because of there's so many, live is live. So there's, there's lots of extremities, things are happening. A lot is happening on the stage as well. So it allowed me a space to kind of look at them very separately and I could hear what I've now created in the cello part and where does the voice now weave in and out of that and the stories how do they weave in and out? how do they accompany how do they contrast with the electronic and the cello as someone who thrives on live performance did it feel different or even perhaps uncomfortable to be able to have the freedom to go back and and say no it, it, it's it's we're off a beat here or you know, I need to, I, I want it to sit just right here. I mean, I think I've listened to seconds and milliseconds of every single piece. I know them too intimately now. <laughs> so there is, yeah, so the, um, I don't know, not necessarily scared, but just wanting to get it as right as I possibly could, you know, uh, and that become, the, that's both the artistic side, but also just the technical side, you know, in putting it together. Um, and what take feels best, which which has the the best type of kind of character development between this section and that section are they relevant? So then I'm just looking at form and dramaturgy in that in that respect, and not just trying to think of it all under one big umbrella and one fell swoop in in performance and just praying like I get it all. Um, in this way, I had more time um, to really try to to get it right and. Um, and do justice, yeah, to these people's stories in the best possible way. Now you've been you've described yourself as a vessel for these people's stories, you know, in difficult grace. How mm -hmm. does being that vessel impact you physically and emotionally? Uh, <laughs> when I first performed this music, um, I was shouldering a lot because I think this project is so uh, personal and so special just for me to kind of, uh, you know, you are, when one is commissioning or one is given or one finds new work, old work, whatever it is, you don't really know what it is until after you perform it. And you may not know what it is for a few performances. And there is, there is risk in even choosing. There's even more risk in daring to perform. Um, and so for me, putting them all together and wondering, do these works even, do they work together? Do they curatorially, dramaturgically, do they, does, what is their through line? And, you know, even after the first performance, I did know, but there was a sense, I remember just being, there's a sense of electricity that was going through me, but also because I was just trying to get this thing right and hoping that this presentation of a performance is a concept even then in 2020, spoke to someone beyond me and then how would it move me and I wouldn't know that until really afterwards and and more specifically not until later in 2020 when I was doing the kind of the mediated films of a few of the pieces from the show that I did in collaboration with the University of Chicago um, that it gave me a chance to really understand what it is I was doing and what I had created with these composers um, and so now um, I'm not so scared of the material <laughs> at this point. Um, it's more so I am just like an actor, just like a performer, but someone of the theater, I'm going to the theater to present these stories, you know, um, and trying to get myself centered um, vocally and instrumentally uh, and phys just physically to kind of to kind of carry this show because it's mostly just me 
throughout the whole thing, you know, uh, carrying all of it and switching, switching roles and characters and headspaces um, at the turn of a dime, because each the you know, pieces are changing in the first half. There's so many different stories and emotions, one after the other. Um, so trying to hold space for that. And even in the, in the recorded versions of it, um, I have more time, more space. Um, but it, it has, these works have changed me. I think it's just, a, it's allowed me to show more of my humanity, even more of it and more vulnerability on stage and uh, to be okay with that, you know, and not feel overly perfect or have to, search to find the perfect performance or deliver the perfect performance, but more so to deliver excellence across all kind of like umbrellas of what we could think that could be, you know, um, and just making sure that in my body, I feel like I'm thrusting forward the right energy and the right gestures, um, opening and closing. Now we're having this conversation two days before you have a recital um, at the Wallace where you'll have the simple task of just performing something like Rachmaninoff. Does, <laughs> but does, but given the responsibility you have, you know, with difficult grace, does going back to a traditional format feel like a vacation from the challenges that difficult grace provides? No, because the Rachmaninoff is such a tight end of a work. Uh, I mean, I've been on tour with it right now. And I just, uh, just a few days ago, just left Boston where I was playing at the Gardner Museum. And um, I mean, that whole program, the, the, the George Walker Sonata, that's also on there, the Schumann Fantasy Stulke, um, but especially the Rachmaninoff, because there's just so much, there are so many details. And, you know, I first started playing this piece in 2003. Um, and it's been interesting to come back to it time and time again and try constantly searching, what more can I say? What more is there that I haven't seen with where I'm at now in my life and where, where I'm at now uh, creatively um, and searching to kind of pull out more. Can I, what, what can I say differently this time um, and not try to just continue to replicate the same thing over and over. Um, and that's the exciting part, also the scary part <laughs> of doing it, but even like, even the second movement of the Rachmaninoff, what I find, it's kind of, I, I found people kind of like toss it off as not as important of a movement, uh, but it's, it goes, the emotions in that second movement fly by so quickly. Even the, the first big theme, which feels so uh melancholic and longing but also there's this draw of beauty that's in these longing lines but also with all the arpeggiations that are happening in the piano it's almost like the two of us the pianist and the cellist are just floating in, in many ways and then all of a sudden we snap back into this very militant square you know uh theme that kind of opens the entire thing um and that's kind of how we close it too you know um and so it's a lot of jumping around just emotionally and trying to kind of be present for every single step along the way and not not necessarily just oh my god that shift or you know that note like a little bit higher there you know like but more so what are what am I seeing what are the stories so I think this show and many other things have, have just inspired me to dig deeper dig even deeper and keep keep searching you know um to try to find something more to say in, inside of the work. And of course, the iconic third slow movement, the Andante. Um, it's something that I think it plagues people because you know you have these, you know, iconic, you know, <laughs> recordings, and we all try to some way live up to that, but eventually I come to the point where I'm just like, I just have to say it as Seth and not trying to kind of replicate something I knew from long before um, and trying to keep it fresh and open and evolving per performance. Um, yeah, I don't want to see Seth Parker Woods as Jacqueline Dupre. No. <laughs> <laughs> I love her. I, 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 she's, she's my, you know, cello hero, you know, for years and years and years. Um, but I found my way through it now and, and that's still, you know, evolving. Um, to kind of say how I say it in the now and how I'm feeling it now 
while still holding on to this sense of suspension of time and stasis, but movement at the same time that is so iconically um, brilliant for, for Rachmaninoff, you know, and that's across all the movements, um, especially the opening, which always of the, of the entire sonata, which really very much so feels like this recitative before we get into the first big thing, yeah. One more thing that I want to ask you about as it relates to, to Difficult Grace, because I don't know exactly what the chronology is and when you started this, but I know that you were also, you know, you were involved with Jason Moran and Alicia Hall Moran, you know, with Two Wings, the music of Black America in migration. And I'm wondering, you know, was there an overlap with the creation of two different approaches to what my, the theme of migration in America or did did your experience with with Jason inspire your own journey into what this history was? Well, um, I had already seen some of the, I think they're overlapping. You know, I'd already had started work on Difficult Grace, you know, before it was Difficult Grace, the pieces themselves, they weren't all created for the show. It came together as like the culmination, part of the culmination of one of the last few concerts I would give um, as artists in residence with the Seattle Symphony, and I was bringing these pieces together, a lot of new works commissioned um, in tandem with me and, and Seattle Symphony, and then others, a few others that had already existed, you know, years but before I even had moved back to the States in 2016. And that when those two works, that is the work by Monty Atkins, Winter Tendrils, with the film by Zoe McLean, and then the work, A, a Single Word Is Not Enough by Pierre Le Grand Tremblay with the duo with myself and uh, Roderick George. Um, but as I'm working through that and piecing it together and you know, getting the text and everything, and then also working with Jason and Alicia, um, I think it just heightened it in the conversations I would have. You know, just, I call Alicia up on the phone. <laughs> we just be talking. And she's a great, you know, she can have the conversations. She's just this amazing brain in that way. And it just feels like she's like reaching back in time to try to understand where things are in her position and then what she's doing and what Jason's doing and then what they're doing collectively and the people that they bring into the fold to tell these stories as they pertain to the different cities that have kind of been part of the the ultimate fabric of this country. Um, and I think it just heightened it, but I think we, I really think we were kind of working in tandem right around the same time, at least when I started to kind of... Uh, collaborate with them on that. And definitely the the, the Coleridge trailer Perkinson was like the, the first work I did with them when, when I did it. And the first show I did with them was in Chicago at the Chicago Symphony, Symphony Center. Um, and that was my first, really played the Perkinson for the first time ever publicly, which was <laughs> scary. Uh, <laughs> I'm, so, sure, I'm sure it came off very well is developing you know so, so I, I I do credit them because they gave me space to really develop some of the things I was doing you know on the other side with my with this project and um, all of that has kind of fed me into kind of uh, led me to where I'm at now um with the work um yeah given how much modern classical music contemporary classical music that that you perform and that you support you know I want to ask you about something that I, I, John Adams and I discussed when I spoke to him earlier this year, which was about how much of the work that's being created now is going to be remembered in the future. And he said it's important to remember that Beethoven had a lot of contemporaries, and we don't really hear about a lot of the works that they did because they just didn't you know, hold up. They didn't enter into the canon for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. And when you're collaborating with as many composers as you are, Seth, do you ever have a sense of how history might look at these pieces or any any belief that, you know, these are pieces that are going to sort of do the impossible, that are going to have a lifespan beyond this moment in time? You know, it's it's hard to know. I don't think there is a direct straight cut answer for that. Um, did Beethoven know? Do you know Symphony Number no. 5 would be the biggest hit and would be played, you know, <laughs> centuries later? No, he didn't. You know, you took a risk, but you're also writing so much. Um, and I, I don't know if I have a direct answer as to whether 
the work I have been involved in, in, in creating or in championing um, uh, will stand the test of time. Uh, and I don't know if I'm necessarily interested um, in that. What I am interested in is really trying to tell their stories now and doing the best I can to give them leg, give them as many legs as possible. That is beyond one performance, two performances. And, you know, if I can get 10 performances over a few years, um, for, for me, that says a lot. And then, you know, come back here another year to play it again and, and again, you know, and it becomes something that I find myself inside of. Um, that becomes part of me just as the box suites and the rock on and off and others, you know, um, cause there was a period of stretch of time where I didn't play the, the rock on and off. There was a period of stretch of time where I didn't play box suites. Um, and I think it's okay to, you, know, you don't play them every single day and every single month of your life. You, there's so much more that is out there. And I think it's at least for important for me to be able to continue to broaden and widen your palette um so, so you don't stay closed off to the idea well this is what I really like and this is all there is out there and that's all I'm gonna ever pay attention to because I'm like there's so much that's being made daily and weekly and it's like finding the right type of classical music you like the right type of classical you know umbrella composers that you do like the right types of contemporary composers you that you do like they're not all the same and they're not synonymous with each other um so it's just finding the the sonorities the storytelling that you read that really resonates with you um which I guess in some ways is why I have I have I wasn't one of those musicians that was trying to pride myself or push myself to learn every single piece in the canon, which I think is a very funny thing to say that one plays all of the rep of the canon. And <laughs> uh, this is a, a very weird thing to say because there's the canon of classical music is thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of pieces. There's no way you play all of the <laughs> Um, no, you're, but that but when you're talking about the canon you're typically talking about the five to ten pieces that everybody knows exactly um which is gate that 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 in even of itself is 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 a gate kept situation um and so um i've i've prided myself and pushed myself to 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 pull from the composers that i really love and the pieces that i really love from from those composers and play those and then pair them alongside works of the now, works being created now, or at least in the last 50, 60 years that I, that I find um, to be really powerful that can have conversation across timelines. A composer like Ted Hearn, whose work I admire greatly, and I really like Ted as a person as well. Mm -hmm. um, there are people who are going to say that work is too challenging for them, or it requires them to do something they're not used to doing in a concert hall. And one thing I love about what you've been doing is you have regularly found a way of creating a dialogue between, say, 17th century works and contemporary works so that there's a space where people can sort of make their own connection or allow you to make a connection for them. What are the challenges for you in hopefully winning over those skeptics who think that this is just an intellectual exercise and not an emotional one? I think it's important to talk to your audiences first and foremost. There was a time where I was coming up and, you know, I wasn't taught how to engage audiences or the idea of engaging audiences was just playing to them, at them. But like, what is it to actually talk to them and 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 guide them through a little bit of what they're going to experience and hear? I think that's always an issue when concert goers are thinking about or going to um, concerts of of new music of contemporary music um, is they are not in the know that something's being kept from them and hidden from them they don't know the formula um, or the formula that they're used to you know experiencing um, is not the one <laughs> they're about to hear or be presented to them um, so therefore they feel lost and people want to belong people want to feel in and I get that or have some glimpse into what's going on so therefore when it feels too heady too esoteric um, it's it's a, a, a boiling down to that the, the, the recipe has been kept from them 
Uh, so for me, it's always been trying to, I don't really like program notes and that way it's more, I would rather just talk from my heart about what this work is, what it means to me, connections to the composer, whether alive or dead. Um, and, you know, ref relevance of what, what, where this work is now and, and also how it links to, um, curatorially to the rest of the program, you know, um, so that's always been, has been and, and has been for some time now, my way of kind of connecting the work and trying to kind of keep it in vogue for now and for this year of 2022, 2023, 2030, whatever it is, you know, what is it to allow audiences to understand what this work can mean now and not on its own, but also in relation to the things that are around it on a program, unless it is truly by itself. But even if you're playing box suites, you know, what is the relationship between three, five, and six, or what is the relationship of, of one, two, and four, if you're creating them in that way, you know? Of course, of course. Or cute, you could just play them all in one concert and then you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> One of these days you'll do that. You know that, right? You um, know that that yeah, is yeah. that is part of your future at some point. That yeah. is the Mount Olympus every cellist has yeah. to do. Some cellists, not all cellists do it, but you know, many do. They do do it. Um, I'm sure it will come at some point. No doubt. Not well, in the next two seasons. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have enough on my plate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I I want to conclude our time, Seth. You know, you brought up. Um, the artist Jacob Lawrence, and I was able to go back and do some research on some of the things he had to say about his creativity. Mm -hmm. And he said, if at times my productions do not express the conventionally beautiful, there is always an effort to express the universal, universal beauty of man's continuous struggle to lift his social position and to add dimension to his spiritual being. Mm -hmm. How important is it for your work to do the same thing? And to what extent do you believe, or at least hope, you've been successful in that effort? Jacob Lawrence coming in heavy. <laughs> <laughs> um, wow. Um, I need some, I think I have that. That's, that's a whole, um, that's a dissertation. Oh. <laughs> and he was just answering a question. I know. <laughs> um, You know, my, long ago, my mother said to write your life in pencil. And I stand by those words. And those have been words that have guided me for all these decades. And um, and something that I impart to my students, um, because I, I truly believe in it, the idea of trying to be as open as possible. Have your, your goal, your bucket list, your plan, um, but also be open to other things, you know, aligning with that or converging with that, that can expand or reroute um, what you thought you would ultimately only be doing, but maybe this plus, which is why I think when people ask me, oh, is here a cellist? I'm like, well, would you, or would you describe yourself as a cellist? And I always say cellist plus. <laughs> oh, because I taken on so many other things and things that I realized that I really do love or that I am really good at. Um, and so for me, it has been a grappling of how far do I want to take this career? How far do I really want to take myself? And the cello in and of itself as a, an expressive vehicle has taken me around the world. And I've seen more than I, you know, I thought at, you know, five, six years old, this little kid from Texas, um, that I was just playing it in Mrs. Parker's strings class. I had no idea I'd be where I'm at now, you know, and doing that, which I'm doing and been able to meet the people across so many different continents and cultures and the cello being kind of the ticket for that. Um, and so I do grapple and I, and I, I have been in conflict with the idea of should, should I have just taken the easier route and just solely dedicated my life only to just playing just classical music or at one point just doing only early music um or or have i done the right thing in 
choosing to do the old and also to do the new um, and find ways for them to talk to each other and therefore lifting myself further up and, and, and kind of immortalizing even more of my humanity and being able to be that vulnerable in front of so many others if, if and if only then it holds and leaves space for others um, to be vulnerable too. It's a gift to be an artist because we are of the few that really are mirrored reflections of society. We are the ones that kind of set the trends. We are the ones that tell the stories that are hard to be told or that are gate kept or hidden in many ways, unearthing stories and emotions. Um, so, I've come to the realization and I probably go through this every few months. <laughs> like maybe I should be doing more of this gospel. Maybe I should be doing this concert. I should do this concert again too. But what I always continue to come back to is I don't need to play each and every of everything because I'm already doing so much. And it's a privilege for me to have arrived where I'm at now and to be able to choose the stories, to actively choose the stories regardless of timeline that I want to and to champion them in the best possible ways that I can um, and to know that it's a long game and those the ways in which I see those stories and the ways in which I see myself connected to them will evolve and the idea that I can keep practicing and continue to get better at telling those stories. And one day thanks Susan Sarandon for this entire journey you're on. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> she was the reason I first saw the cello. Yeah, yeah. Seth, I really appreciate it. Indeed. Thank you again, Chris. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.